All right, let's turn in our Bibles, if you would, to Psalms 119 this morning. Psalms 119. Psalms chapter 119. This, of course, is the longest chapter in the Bible, and it has 176 verses in it, and uh, every single verse has, makes a reference to the Word of God, and uh, the Word of God is referred to as statues or commandments or the Word or the righteous judgments or there's some word in each verse that refers to the Word of God in 176 verses. I want us to look at Psalms 119 and verse 17. I'd like to read verses 17 to 24. Psalms 119, verse 17. Deal bountifully with thy servant, that I may live and keep thy word. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. My soul breaketh for the longing that it hath, that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Remove me from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. Princes also did sit and speak against me, but thy servant did meditate in thy statutes. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for each one here this morning. We pray that you'll bless, uh, Father, the preaching of the word of God. We thank you, dear Lord, for uh, the singing this morning, the congregational singing. We thank you for the song that Sarah sang, uh, dear Lord, and we thank you that we can turn our eyes upon thee. And uh, Lord, when we're down and out and discouraged, and, and uh, Father, we just ask you, dear Lord, to uh, save that lost soul that might be in the congregation. I pray, Father, for your people, Lord, that you would help us to live for you in these last days. Uh, God, to be exactly what you would have us to be, Father. Use us, Lord, for your honor and for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We read here in Psalms chapter 119, verses 17 to 24, and as I mentioned, every verse in this chapter deals with the Word of God. And I want to call your attention here. The psalmist is talking here about the Word of God and, and many different things about God's testimonies and His righteous judgments and His law and His Word and so forth. But I want to call your attention to verse 19, where he says, I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. I want to preach a message entitled, I am a stranger in the earth. First few words of verse 19. I am a stranger in the earth. Now, according to the Bible, we were strangers before we got saved. Before we got saved, the Bible says in Ephesians 2.12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Ephesians 2.12 says, before we got saved, we were strangers from the covenants of promise. Ephesians 2.19 says down there, now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God. So before we got saved, 
we were strangers from the covenants of promise, according to the word of God. And then after we're saved, uh, I want to say that we are strangers also. The psalmist says here in verse 19, Psalms 119, I am a stranger in the earth. So I, I want to tell you today, if you're saved, this world is not your home. Amen. Right. You were a stranger before you got saved, and you're even a stranger after you got you get saved in a different way, of course. I don't know about you, but I just feel like a stranger in this old world. Amen. A stranger. And he says, hide not thy commandments from me. There is no loneliness like it to be a stranger in a foreign land, to wander the streets of a bustling city, to be surrounded by millions of people, unable to read the signs in the shop windows, unable to understand a word that is being said on every hand, to be friendless and alone, to be a stranger. That is how it was with the Lord Jesus Christ. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, he confessed himself to be a stranger on this earth. He was homeless in the world his hands had made. He longed for someone to talk to. Nobody spoke the language of heaven, so he found the companionship and comfort in the word of God. He listened to what his father had to say to him in his word. He talked to his father in prayer. The scripture banished loneliness from his soul. It spoke the language of the land from which he had come. And I want to say that it will do the same for you and I as strangers in this whole earth. We all have times when we feel lonely, when we feel that nobody understands or cares. We all have deep needs. Every person is an island. We reach across the seas of our isolation to relatives, neighbors, and friends, to acquaintances and people with whom we rub shoulders every day. But at times, we are spiritual Robinson Crusoes, isolated. We have all kinds of gadgets to help us banish our solitude, but lonely moments still come. Then it is that this book, this Bible, can banish loneliness from our soul. It inter introduces us to the friend that sticketh closer than a brother, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The psalmist says here, in the context of every verse talking about his word, I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. <clears throat> this word stranger means a foreigner, a sojourner, a temporary inhabitant. And this is a very profound statement because it describes our position as Christians today in this world. If you're going to mature in Christ, then you must realize that this world is not your final home. You're just passing through here. Don't sink your roots here on this earth. Live with eternity in view. A lot of people, a lot of professing Christians across America, they have their roots in this old world. Do you realize, folks, that you and I can die at any second? I mean, and when you die, that's it. You're out of here. I mean, you're not going to take anything with you. Don't sink your roots here on this earth. Hebrews 11, 13 says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. If you and I are going to mature in the Lord and progress, progress in the Lord and uh, go on for, in the things of God and be what God wants us to be, we're going to have to realize that we have to live with eternity in view. First Peter 2.11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, Strangers and pilgrims, that's all we are. This world is not our home. Amen. We're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Yeah. So we, uh, we are strangers and foreigners here on this earth. I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. 1 Peter 2, verse 11. Now I want us to look at the life of a foreigner in another country this morning. And you'll understand why Christians are foreigners on this earth. And I want to say this, that 
for you and I to continue to grow and get out the word of God and be what God wants us to be. It's an amazing thing. I'm not trying to be a smart aleck this morning, but a lot of people make a profession of faith, but they never grow. They never go on in the things of God. And that's why uh, you and I have to get into a good Bible-believing, Bible-preaching and teaching church and where they preach and teach the Word of God and be faithful, and that Word of God will be preached and taught, and you'll grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Just like a newborn baby. A newborn baby comes home, that, that baby's not ready for steak or for pork chops or anything like that. It's milk. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that you may grow thereby. 1 Peter 2, verse 2. And so uh, the, in his book, Folk Psalms of Faith, Ray Stedman tells the story of a woman who had been a school teacher for 25 years. When she heard about a job that would mean a promotion, she applied for the position. However, someone who had been teaching for only one year was hired instead. She went to the principal and asked why she was not hired. The principal responded and said, ma'am, I'm sorry, but you have not had 25 years of experience as you claim. You've only had one year's experience 25 times. During that whole time, the teacher had not improved. And that's a, an illustration. God wants us to ripen and mature in our walk with him. He wants us to fulfill his purpose and will for our lives by reaching others for Christ. And when we fail to mature and develop Christian character, we fail to see what God wants for us and have difficulty in knowing his will. And so why Christians are foreigners on this earth? First of all, number one, uh, foreigners must deal with a different language than their own many times. When you talk to a lot of these missionaries, one of the barriers they say when they first get to the field before they really learn the language uh, on the field uh, is there's a language barrier and foreigners must deal with a different language than their own many times and as Christians our speech is to be different than that of unsaved people our language is not to be filthy, sensual, suggestive or blasphemous what comes out of our mouth reveals what's going on in our, our hearts for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh Matthew 12, 34. Our speech should reflect the Holy Spirit that lives within us and reveal to people that there is something different about us in a good way. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 10, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Ephesians 4.31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's Ephesians 4 verse 31 and 32. Now think about this, never underestimate the power of your words. Wilfred Peterson said this, he said, soft words sung in a lullaby will put a baby to sleep. Excited words will stir a mob to violence. Eloquent words will send armies marching into the face of death. Encouraging words will fan to flame the genius of a Rembrandt or a Lincoln. Powerful words will mold the public mind as the sculptor molds his clay. Words spoken or written are a dynamic force. Unquote. Writing of Napoleon and his Italian campaign, Emil Ludwig said, quote, half of what he achieves, Napoleon, is achieved by the power of words. Words are the swords that we use in our battle for success and happiness. How others react toward us depends in a large measure upon the words that we speak to them. Life is a great whispering gallery that sends back echoes of the words that we send out. Our words are immortal too. 
They go marching through the years and the lives of all those with whom we come in contact. When you speak, when you write, remember the creative power of your words. In Matthew 26, when Christ is getting ready to be crucified, the young damsel, the young lady came out there and said to Peter, uh, thy speech bereath you, betrays you, old English, but bereath you. She said, your speech betrays you, Peter. Your speech gives you away. Now, I know that she was speaking about him being a Galilean from a different part, uh, a different geographical location of the world. But spiritually speaking, our speech ought to betray us. People ought to hear us talk and they ought to say, you know what? I think that guy's a Christian. I think that woman's a Christian. I think that young lady, that young man, that teenager, uh, that boy, that girl, I think they're they're different. They're, I think they're a Christian. I've never heard him cuss. I've never heard him tell a dirty joke or off-color joke or nothing. They speak about the Lord and the things of God. The Bible says they are of the world. Therefore speak they of the world and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us in 1 John 4, verses 5 and 6. So number one, foreigners must deal with a different language than their own many times. And the psalmist says here in Psalms 119, verse 19, I am a stranger in the earth. You ever feel like that? I'll tell you what I do. Amen? I do. Foreigners, uh, strangers, foreigners must deal with a different language than their own many times. Number two, <coughs> foreigners in many countries are not accepted by the people. They are considered as intruders or outcasts. Now, you can go to different parts of America yeah. and not be accepted. Right. You go to different parts of, of the United States. I won't mention the different parts, but uh, you go to different parts of the United States, and if you're not from that area... And they know immediately whether you are or not. You're, they, they will kind of look at you like this. <coughs> they know you're not one of them. You're not from their area. And it's true in this country. It's definitely true around the world. Amen. And you go around the world. Foreigners in many countries are not accepted by the people. They're considered as intruders or, intruders or outcasts. We too as believers are not accepted by a wicked world. Antichrist and anti-Christian sentiment continues to rise all over the world, even in the United States, of course. And we've, been, we've been preaching on this, Brother Gary, Brother Frank, Brother Mark, and several guys here preaching, teaching stuff have mentioned it. I've mentioned it from the pulpit. Christian bashing has become popular and the blasphemy of Jesus has become common. You're allowed to say anything you want to say about Christians or about Jesus or the Bible or Christianity, and uh, but you're not allowed to say anything about anybody else or anything else. But Jesus and Christians and the Bible and, and Bible-believing churches are ridiculed and disdained even right here in, our, in America, in our country today. Each year approximately, and this was from about 10 or 15 years ago, probably more now, but each year, approximately 160,000 believers are martyred for Christ around the world. Paul warned us of the world's sentiment toward us. In uh, 1 Corinthians 4.13, Paul said, Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and, and are the off-scouring, is the word he uses. What's that mean? Just a minute, I'll tell you and are the off-scouring of all things unto this day. Paul said that 2,000 years ago. Now the word off-scouring means what is wiped off. Scrapings from a meal. What is wiped off? Scrapings from a meal. The off-scouring. This is the attitude that the world has towards Christians. And we could give illustrations and I'm sure most of you folks here in the congregation this morning could stand up and give an illustration or an example of somebody treating you in a wrong way because you're a Christian and because you love the Lord and you're uh, trying to serve God and so forth. I'm going to tell you what, it's just, it's just the way that it is. And I'm going to tell you something. I wish I could stand up here and tell you that it's going to get better though, but it's not going to get better. It's probably going to get worse. It's going to get worse. Foreigners, I'm a stranger in the earth. 
and foreigners and strangers in many countries are not accepted by the people. I mean, even Jesus, the Bible says he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world received him not. There. And the world knew him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. In John 1, verse 11 and 12. In John 1, 10, it says he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. Mm. Imagine making the world and the world don't even know you. He made the world. He made us. And we say, we don't want you. Imagine a human being rejecting Christ as their Savior. God is the one that made them. God is the one that gave them the breath that they drew while they were here on this earth for however many years it was. God is the one that blessed them and gave them the things they had on this earth. And they thumb their nose up at God and say, I don't want you, Jesus, and I don't want anything to do with you. Reject Jesus Christ and then die and go to hell and burn forever. Mm. What a terrible thing. Imagine many of God's people, <clears throat> many people that say, I'm saved. They've repented of their sins. They've received Christ as their Savior. They say they're born again and God, God loves me and God died for me and I thank God for salvation. Then they don't really want to serve Him. They don't really want to put Him first in their life. That's a sad thing today. Uh, foreigners in many countries are not accepted by the people. They are considered as intruders or outcasts. Number three, the customs and behavior in other countries are different. The customs and behavior in other countries are different. I remember Brother Wood down there at Brother Homer Smith years ago. Brother Homer used to have missionary candidate school in June. Then he had a pastor school in January. And uh, this is back uh, in the 80s and 90s there. And uh, we were down there for eight years in the 90s. And I remember Brother Wood used to tell the missionaries, he said, don't you go to these fields and try to Americanize everybody. Don't you go there and try to make everybody uh, an American and do things the way we do over here in America because it isn't going to work. Right. You're going to run into a lot of problems. He wasn't saying don't preach the word. He wasn't saying don't live right and do right and everything. But he said the customs and behavior in other countries are different. We are not only to speak differently, but we should also behave differently than unbelievers. Customs and behavior in other countries are different. I remember Brother Ted Mullins, him and his wife Lynn are still over in New Guinea. And they've been over there for since the 80s, early 80s, as missionaries to New Guinea. Brother Ted's had heart attacks, and I think Lynn's had physical problems, and they're probably in their middle, middle or late 60s. And uh, I remember him uh, telling me years ago, he told me, he, I said, what, was, what are some of the biggest culture shocks when you got to New Guinea? And he mentioned several things. He said, one of the things was, he said, I'm up preaching. And he says, a woman just starts feeding her baby right in front of everybody. And he said, I was sitting there preaching. I'm going, you know, I mean, he's straight from America over there. The customs and behavior are completely different. And these other third world countries, especially, they do things differently. And uh, they're not, they don't have God. You know, they don't have, I mean, America's got God. And we still act heathenistic over here. But the customs and behavior in other countries are different. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So thirdly, the customs and behavior in other countries are different. And you and I, we're a stranger in the earth. We're saved. We're born again. We're a peculiar people, zealous of good works, according to the Bible. And so you and I should realize that our customs and behavior should be different. We're in a foreign land. We're in a strange place. Number four, why are Christians foreigners and strangers on the earth? Getting directions can be very difficult in another country, number four. Getting directions can be very difficult in another country. I want to tell you what, they can be difficult in some parts of the United States. I remember years ago, uh, back in the, uh, back in the uh, early 90s probably, I guess, and uh, I was up in the New York City area, and I was preaching up there for, I don't know, probably 
two and a half, two or two and a half weeks total. There were several churches I was preaching in different states up in New England and New York City. And I happened to be going through New York City late at night. And in New York City, because of the population, because of all the people and things and traffic, and they do most of their road construction at night. I mean, they start at you know nine or ten o'clock at night and they go to five or six in the morning. Because I mean they're still Instead of 50 million people, there's only 20 million people. You know, that's an exaggeration. But anyways, uh, I, but anyways, make a long story short, I got turned around something up there. I mean, I had construction everywhere and highways and signs. And, and I stopped and asked these guys where something was. I can't remember what it was now. It's 25 years ago. And uh, I can't remember what happened 25 minutes ago. But anyways... <laughs> And this guy said, yeah, you go that way, and you turn on that, and you take Route 405, and you turn left on Route 192, and you go this way. When he got done, I didn't know what he was talking about. So I tried to follow the best I could. I ended up, I think I ended up in Pennsylvania or somewhere. I don't know what in the world I was. But I'm going to tell you what, I was driving all over the place. And uh, but the, the directions can sometimes be uh, bad here in the United States. Foreigners need a guide because they're in a strange place. We need a guide too. For this reason, the psalmist cries out here in Psalms 119, 19, our text verse, I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. That's our guide. God's our guide. His word is our guide. Amen. And uh, we need a guide because we're in a strange place. And for this reason, the psalmist cries, don't hide your commandments from me. I need guidance. I need direction. And uh, I want to thank God that we have a guide. The Lord is our helper and our guide. His word also gives counsel and direction. Hebrews 13, 6. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Psalms 31, 3. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Isaiah 58, 11, and the Lord shall guide thee continually. And I love this verse. Psalms 32, 8, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. God says, I'll guide you with mine eye. And his eyes can see everything. Amen. And knows everything. What a great God we serve today. Amen. He's our God. He's our God. For hundreds of years before Christopher Columbus was born, the motto of the country of Spain was Ni plus ultra. Ni, N-E plus ultra. This is Latin for no more beyond. No more beyond. You see, the Spaniards believed that they'd already discovered everything worth discovering. One of the most beautiful monuments to Christopher Columbus today is a statue in Spain of a huge lion with the words knee plus ultra underneath it. However, the lion is eating the first word, knee, N-E. All that can be read are the words more beyond. This was Columbus's greatest legacy. He proved that there was more beyond beyond. Jesus too has shown us that there is more beyond. Like the lion of the Columbus Monument eating the word knee, the lion of the tribe of Judah erased the notion that death was the end of everything. It is through the death of Christ on the cross of Calvary and his resurrection from the dead that we all can say with assurance that for the Christian, there is plus ultra. There is more beyond. Amen. 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 This life is not where it's at, folks. Thank God for the blessings. Thank God for everything. But there's more beyond. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he winds up that long chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. He says he gives us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, verse 58, therefore, in view of all this, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain 
in the Lord. If you and I are going to ripen and mature as a child of God, you and I got to realize that this world is not our home. That we are pilgrims in this old world. And Jesus is getting ready to come back any second. Yeah. Think about this. I could, you and I could die at any time, and we can be raptured at any time. So why have our roots settled here in this old world? Amen. Why have our roots in this old world? This world is not our home. We're just passing through. We're here. For what is your life? It is even a vapor. Watch this. For what is your life? It is even a vapor. That vapor on that body of water in the early hours of the morning. That small pond or river. You go down there, walking down there, you see that vapor there. It's there and then poof, it's gone. For what is your life? It is even a vapor. I don't care if you live to be 100. It's just a snap of the fingers compared to eternity. Watch this. You see this here? From that end... To that end is eternity. You and I are this. A dot. If that depresses me, preacher. No, it shouldn't. That'll make you just realize how fragile life is. Yeah. Right? And that while we're here each day on this earth, we need to live for God. Amen. And be what God wants us to be. As I close, Psalms 119, verse 19. I am a stranger in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from me. Number one, we've seen the first thing is that strangers and foreigners must deal with a different language than their own many times. Number two, foreigners in many countries are not accepted by the people. They're considered as intruders or outcasts. And that's what the world considers you and I. You intrude in their life when you try to witness to them. They consider you an outcast. Number three, the customs and behavior in other countries are different. And uh, then number four, getting directions can be very difficult in another country. So we need a guide. I thank God we have a guide. Yeah. The Lord, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to the understanding and all thy ways. Acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. He'll direct our paths. And number five, foreigners are citizens of another country. We are citizens of another country. In many countries... They are not allowed to own property or vote. We too are citizens of another country. Our home is in heaven. Yeah. Philippians 3.20, for our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The word conversation means citizenship. We're a citizen of heaven. I'm already in heaven. You say, what do you mean? You're crazy. You're standing up here behind that pulpit. No, I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places right now. Spiritually, I'm already there. Yeah. You say, you are nuts. No, no, I'm, I'm being biblical. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places right now. Number five, foreigners are citizens of another country. We are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And as I've mentioned many times, he was a carpenter while he's here on this earth. I'll tell you what, I bet he can prepare quite a nice place. Amen. Amen. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. John 14, 1 to 3. We're going to be with Jesus. Amen. But while we're here on this earth, the psalmist says, I'm a stranger in the earth. Let's stand if you would. We're going to get a